to stay on mute. You may type questions in the chat box and we'll address these during or at the end of the presentation. We may also open the floor at the end so that you can, uh, can unmute your mic and ask your questions then. So now for our speaker. Dr. Anthony Bashel is a board certified cardiologist who joined Franciscan Physician Network Indiana Heart Physicians in August 2008. After obtaining his undergraduate degree from Lancaster University in England and working in the environmental field in Southern Indiana for a while, Dr. Bashel graduated from Indiana University School of Medicine and completed his residency at Indiana, uh, at Indiana University. He completed his fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at Indiana University Craner Institute of Cardiology. Dr. Bashel has a special interest in heart failure and has a passion for cardiometabolic care. He is a member of the Cardiometabolic Alliance and is a leader in this area at Major Health Partners in Shelbyville, Indiana. Welcome, Dr. Bashel. Great. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me here tonight. This is a great honor. And as the title suggests, we're going to talk about cardiometabolics and what we've been doing at the major health partners down in Shelbyville, Indiana, with our population there. But thank you, everybody, for having me. No disclosures. And, and I'd like to start as, as uh, my background is a little bit of education uh, and teaching. I always like to start when I'm working with residents and students by asking a question. And I often like to start with this question. And I had some of the best answers recently uh, from a med student I was working with. And when I asked her this question, she said, well, it depends. And, and that's the answer I've always been looking for. And I said, well, it depends on what? And they said, well, it depends on the stage. And I said, the stage of what? And she said, well, the degree of, of seriousness of the cardiometabolic disease and lung cancer. And, and this is the exact answer I've always been looking for. And I finally said, well, why do you think I'm asking you this? And she said, well, because they're both really serious problems and how we organize and take the care of our patients in these scenarios is important. Uh, and this is what I wanted to do. And I think often, and, and I'll ask you each to reflect on your own practices. If we say to someone you have lung cancer, everyone appropriately gets very concerned. But if you often say to someone, well, you're obese and diabetic and you have some heart disease, they go, well, well, OK, what am I going to do about it? And I, and I think it just helps elevate the, the gravity of both conditions and puts them on a, on a playing field where people can view them a little differently. So the underlying themes of tonight's presentation, the key word collaboration comes through over and over and over, and particularly down in uh, Shelbyville between ourselves and primary care, but all the players down there, including the other specialists. We really want to focus on prevention, primary and secondary, and, and a case I'll present later will hopefully uh, sort of emphasize some of this role. And, and this is a, a, an interesting one, the, the concept of challenging medical inertia. Uh, it, it can be very difficult nowadays taking patients who, who are doing quite well and, and then trying to get them uh, and the system to kind of move to a, a different degree of medication and care, but knowing that potentially they have the opportunity to feel better at the end of it. We're all faced with this difficulty in access to therapies uh, and, and the access to therapies can, can be many challenging, often with costs being a, a significant one presented. We also like the concept of utilizing metrics and lower for longer, which is really emerging in the primary and secondary phase of trying to get the numbers such as LDL, A1Cs and get them lower and try and keep our patients lower in a sustained fashion. And the final one is really to intensify someone's medical regimen, but actually de-escalating the pharmaceutical burden. And I'm hoping the case I present tonight really emphasizes this point. Where you, where you can end up with ultimately fewer medications or a similar regimen, but actually actually achieving greater goals. And this one I think is really fitting for the time. You know, as we've evolved through uh, our medical training and physicians, there's often gone from the, we tell a patient what to do, then we try and teach a patient. But I think we're really moving into the zone where if we include a patient, and we often see the phrase shared decision-making, and I think this is a good, a good topic and, and a good goal for uh, care work, healthcare workers to do. The objective, the objective we had at Major Health Partners was to use the CMCA guidelines and leadership to implement a cardiometabolic program providing meaningful change in an underserved rural community. And that community, by doing this, we wanted to target our goal-directed medical therapies, affect a reduction in hospital admission, achieve target metrics that affect outcomes, 
to help realize sustainable weight loss and ultimately to help patients feel better. And I often feel a little bit bad putting the help patients feel better at the bottom because I think that's often my number one goal with patients is really to help them feel better with what we're doing. So what is the community of Shelbyville? It's a rural hospital. Many of you, if you drive down towards the Cincinnati on 74, it's down there on the left if you're heading south and on the right if you're heading north. And it's about a county of about 44,000 people. It's predominantly white with a small Latino and African-American community. And when we look at Shelbyville, if you actually look at the median income, compared to Indiana, it's not too bad. However, you have, when you drill into the data a little bit, by the time we come to it, about 46% of the population there are financially challenged to meet the medical needs of which they face, presenting additional challenges to how to take care of a population. In addition, and I'm just going to choose this particular statistic, when we look at the national average of heart failure death per 100,000, the national average is at 184, Indiana at 237, and Shelby County starts to head up to the highest level, but not quite the highest level at 2 foot 148. So we're dealing with a population that experiences more illness, more heart failure, more deaths from heart failure than the average in Indiana and uh, the US, whilst at the same time facing some financial challenges with which to get the medical therapy. And part of our goal of the CMCA major health partners was to actually see if we could challenge this to bring the care to the population. So major health partners, it's the major medical provider for Shelby County. In October of 2021, it signed up to join the Cardiometabolic Alliance. And the other players that have always been present is the Franciscan Alliance and Indiana Heart Physicians. A major health partners, Franciscan and Indiana Heart, have been working in close collaboration for well over 20 years, started by the original member here, Dr. Buzz Hickman. And the main role of cardiology was to provide a collaboration with the primary care that, worked, that established the relationship with the CMCA. And, and to put it in perspective, when Major Health Partners signed up, they became the first primary care initiative to join the CMCA. And we became the first collaborative. Everywhere else the CMCA is present, it's a cardiology driven initiative. And one of the concepts was so that we could cast a wider net in caring for our patients and particularly in getting the primary prevention role as well. In addition, we're fortunate enough to have renal on site and renal with the Franciscan available. We have endocrine consultation available to add to our support. So we already see the base players in place, the sense of collaboration, which pre-existed joining the CMCA, but certainly has been a real boon to its success. And who is the Cardiometabolic Center for Alliance? It was developed by Dr. Mikhail Kosoborod, and, and just to sort of educate those who may not be aware of who he is, he's one of the prime researchers for the SGL2 inhibition. He's based at St. Luke's in Kansas, and if you, you see any papers on SGL2 inhibitors, there's usually his name attached to them somewhere. And a little personal story he will tell is when he was doing his research and he started to see that these drugs had significant cardiovascular implications that were positive, he wanted to get the message out there, but as he tried to refer saying, please start SGL2 inhibition, he found that it wasn't really being very well adopted. As a result in St. Luke's, he inter in introduced the CMCA program. And what is this program? They glean guidelines from the US and international sources. They make resources available to help other medical facilities introduce the cardiometabolic care. There's constant ongoing updates. There's access to National REDCAT research database. So you can assess how you're doing against metrics that they've set, metrics with other CMCA members. And they have a constant ongoing update of the guidelines gleaned from throughout the world. And when you look at the main, when you look at who, who makes up the team on a day-to-day -day basis, obviously the most important members are our patients. We have the physician, which is me, uh, my nurse practitioner, which is Nicole, physician's assistants, and medical office support staff. My integrated care manager there is Marissa, who works in making sure the right patient is put in front of me and works diligently to get access to medications uh, and has done it with uh, tremendous success. The nurse navigator, Peyton, assists 
with the game, making sure the right patients come to me and supporting us in getting the correct information that we can upload into REDCap. And also available, but these have been available for quite some time, are the collaborating clinicians. We have endocrinologists, other cardiologists being incredibly supportive. We have pharmacists, dietitians, and educators available. Many of these players are already in place at major and obviously at the Franciscan as well. And it was really more a case of taking the staff we had and reorienting it and using some guidelines and re-implementing how we use the, our staff that has helped us gain the success that we've been getting. So I wanted you to choose this case because I think it's a, a, an example of those underlying themes that I was presenting at the beginning. Mr. R is a 64-year-old male, a type 2 diabetic, preserved ejection fraction heart failure with New York Heart Association Class 3. In January of 2009, he had a cabbage. He has hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's overweight, but he's not obese. He has chronic kidney disease, stage 3A2, meaning his uh, GFR is below 60 and he's spilling some protein into the urine. He's got COPD and he's no longer smoking. When he first came to me, which is just a little over a year now, he described it in his notes from uh, prior providers as feeling cl currently clinically stable. And he himself personally said, I feel better than I have for any time in the last 18 months. But the 18 months before had not been good for him. He'd had multiple medical visits to different physicians and professionals. In actual fact, I tried to stop and count so I could present a number here tonight just to give an idea of the amount of physician and health healthcare professional visits he'd had. And I lost count after about 50. He'd been to multiple hospitals throughout the system and he'd had two prolonged admissions with acute decompensated heart failure. So when we look at the kind of resource in terms of efforts from people and time going into trying to help him, it had been substantial. And at the end of his last admission, about six months prior, a request for DNR had been made. That has since been rescinded. So after multiple attempts to make him feel better, he was hitting a point where his medical team and himself thought, well, maybe he has less than six months to live uh, and we were time uh, to really throw in the towel. At this point, he went to his primary care physician. But when he came to me, his blood pressure was 136 over 88. So a little bit high, but not too bad. He's a little overweight. His A1C at 8.7, I think most of us agree, is a bit too high. His GFR is at 51, and he has about 233 of protein in the urine. And his LDL is 54. So as we look at Mr. R overall, his overall numbers and feelings, what he's saying in clinic, is not too bad. He's been fairly well managed to this point with some, some obvious bit of work to be done. And his primary care had already started to work on that and about four weeks before had started semaglutide. And he, this was his array of meds. And I'll just kind of let you read through his unglipizide, metformin, lysinoprofrosamide, potassium, metopol, atorvastatin, aspirin. And he was on about 30 shots, sorry, 21 shots of insulin a week. And much of this has just been recently titrated with the recent addition of semaglutide. And it was the work that his primary care physician had been doing had overall got his blood pressure in a much better control, and he commented to me that his sugars had been much improved as he'd been started on the semaglutide. A recent echo showed an EF of 50%, mild diastolic dysfunction, and at rest he had an elevated left atrial pressure. And so I was wondering, if his if pressure's elevated at rest, what would it do when he would exert? You know, whether with a treadmill or walking with this gets significantly elevated because one of his main complaints was he was having shortness of breath, which was mainly being attributed to his COPD. And most people are thinking that his heart was fairly quiescent in the contribution to his disease. It's a mild RV dysfunction, no significant valve disease. And a lexicon, in my view, showed no significant ischemia. So the patient was doing okay, but after all the visits and the work, I wondered if that was good enough. The medical commitment to Mr. R has been substantial and the work of his primary care in improving his situation, taking him from wanting to be DNR to rescinding it and with much improving numbers was pretty substantial as well. But this is what I wanted to do. I really wanted to intensify his medical treatment while kind of de-escalating some of his pharmacy. And what does this mean? 
I wanted to try and remove or reduce medicines that were perhaps just treating the numbers, perhaps medicines that may have just had a neutral effect on the underlying cardiometabolic process, potentially even remove medicines that may be harmful, add medications that treat the underlying process. For example, with systolic heart failure, we're becoming famous with the four pillars of medicine, but then taking those medicines and getting to dose titration. In addition, and we wanted to look at other aspects that would help his care that's not necessarily just pharmaceutical. And we really wanted to try and remove his need for constant visits to physicians and healthcare professionals. Now, while this takes a little time commitment up front and reorganizing the clinic the way we had described at the beginning, and it takes people to be involved in the short term. However, over the long term, what I hope to demonstrate with this case, it actually reduces resource utilization while producing a better outcome. So this was my goal for his medications. I wanted to get rid of the glipizide if possible, the potassium, the Lasix, the lisinopril. Lisinopril is a great drug, but I thought there were other potentials. And I wanted to try and reduce his insulin dosing and frequency as able. So the medicines I wanted to try and introduce were GLP-1 RAs with potential GIPs, SGL-2 inhibition, Arnie's, mineralocorticoids, statins, medicines that where there is at least some evidence, strong evidence, or even some evidence that presents a trend. So with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, I think we could improve his glycemic control, and this was already in evidence. It would provide cardiovascular protection. The studies in New England in 2016 clearly showed this, and also may help with satiety, thereby assisting his weight loss, and for other effects that promote well-being. And much of this information is contained in the ADA 2023 guidelines, but I just want to take a slight tangential view for a minute, is when you look at the semaglutide, the GLP-1 medicine, this is just a certain view of research that's going on into what they're being studied for. There's currently a combination with semaglutide and dapagliflozin, but it's also being used to see if it'll help Alzheimer's, if it'll help NASH, if you'll help diabetic eye disease. Gisepatide has a trial going for chronic heart failure with preserved ejection fri fraction. The STEP trials are also using semaglutide for a similar. So these medicines are being used widely and researched widely for far ranging cardiometabolic effects. So in starting a GLP-1 receptor agonist, we have to ask ourselves, how does it work? And just keep me at a more clinical level, it promotes an early satiety by working on the brain. And I explain this to patients. For patients who struggle with eating, it sends a signal saying you're full and you quit eating. And it supports them in controlling their diet. It slows gastric emptying. And I think this provides in some people some of the nausea GI effects. But if they reduce the amount of food they take in, this nausea very soon passes and most patients, in our case, over 95% can tolerate it. Now, it tends to give a physiologic release of insulin, mimicking, uh, so mimicking more uh, a natural response. The side effects tend to be a little bit of nausea and GI effects, and in reducing PO intake, it helps them work. If they're on sulfonylureas and insulin, you have to be cautious about potentially getting hypoglycemic. But the GLP-1 receptor agonist used in isolation or without sulfonylureas and insulin will generally not drop the blood sugar too low, making them safe medicines to use even in older patients where we worry about hypoglycemia. So semaglutide had been started four weeks prior. His daily blood sugar readings were already improving. <clears throat> and if you go by the guideline, and the indication for the medicine. If you increase his dose from 0.5 to 1 milligram, you could expect almost a 1.8 reduction in his hemoglobin A1C. So if we could get him to 1 milligram of semaglutide, his A1C should hit 6.9. And I think a lot of us would be very pleased to see hemoglobin with A1C of under 7. Our target at the CMHCA is to generally get people under 6.5 without lows if possible. But in addition, this would still leave him taking sulfonylurea and daily insulins. So this is one of the initial medication challenges we often face is what do you do with the sulfonylurea? What do you do with the insulin? And these are the current meds we were looking at that we would have to adjust. 
And one of the biggest fears for this is would we drive him hypoglycemic? And this is somewhat of a rhetorical question is what would you do and why? Would you titrate it up? Would you stop the glimepiride? Would you adjust the insulins? Would you do all of the above? And I think when we look at actually introducing some of these medications, this actually acts as one of the little bit of the access to, sorry, the barriers to access is that some of the initial management when we're concerned about hypoglycemia, which is a very real concern, uh, kind of limits some physicians and actually do go, go it moving forward. Particularly myself, cardiology, who we're not used to using insulin meds. So this is where the collaboration comes in, working with primary care. And I have to give a big shout out to our endocrinologists who've been superb in, a, in responding with us and supporting here, uh, particularly Dr. Mike Hancock, who's one of our consultants down there. They've been very supportive in guiding us through this process. So this is one where the, the collaboration really works in expediting getting patients on these medications. So to the question, what would we do and why? In actual fact, we didn't change the semaglutide at all. We started ampagliflozin, and this was why. He has diastolic heart failure. He has chronic kidney disease. He's spilling protein into the urine, and he's a diabetic. So he has three strong indications for ampagliflozin. And there's suggestion it may be synergistic, but we think at least additive between using semaglutide and ampagliflozin, and this is what we started. As people know, and pagliflozin can have a diuretic effect as well as a blood sugar lowering effect. So now we have two things we have to consider. What do we do with the sulfonylurea, insulin, furosemide, potassium, glimepiride? And, and again, once again, I think this has been a little bit of a barrier to access in managing this. And this is where the beauty of collaborating with primary care and other specialists has really paid off. So what we did, we started, we continued semaglutide, started in pagliflozin, we reduced his furosemide to PRN dosing. We reduced his potassium to PRN dosing. We cut his glimepiride by 50% and going to one tablet daily. We advised daily weights, call us if he got short of breath, watch for swelling. And he was already checking his sugars regularly and familiar with adjusting his own insulin, advising him to watch for low blood sugars. Part of the system is my nurse pain will often call in about a week or two. So rather than have a follow up visit to see how they're doing is to call up in a week or two. We often get follow up blood work in that time frame as well and potentially make adjustments accordingly. So in addressing SGL2 inhibitors, you want to look at the volume status. In many patients, SGL2 inhibitors will act as a diuretic. And if you have high sugar and fairly reasonable kidney function, that diuresis can be quite brisk. As a result, adjusting the Lasix down or diuresis down or holding it or going to PRN like we did would be an appropriate step. In addition to look at the glucose control and if the sugars are running high, sometimes leaving it, if they're running in a reasonable fashion to cut out the glimepiride by 50% and cut down the insulins by about 10 to 20%. So to consider what's the glucose, what's the volume? And at first, when I first addressed this, it personally can be a bit nerve wracking at first. And then it comes down to just knowing a limitation of self. And I asked many times, Mike Hancock, I would ask the primary care physicians what they thought to do, got very rapid responses. And we were often able to do this within the context of the same day of clinic. And just as a quick look at an algorithm that I, I think is one of the best ones I've seen out there, as a caution, hypertension, hypovolemia, do not start SGL2 inhibitors. Normotension, euvolemia, hypertension, hypervolemia. We consider what is the volume, what is the sugar? And particularly in adjusting other medications, if you have sulfonylureas, reducing their dose by 50% or even stopping them and reducing rapid action insulin by 10 to 20 and basal by 10. What is the nice thing with many insulin users is they're very comfortable doing this themselves. And if they're not, they tell you and we know to get help. Once again, showing some of the help from the collaboration. So we have on semaglutide 0.25 sub Q weekly and pagliflozin in 10 daily. And we want to start to look to titrate. We actually ultimately stop glimepiride, furosemide, PRN, potassium, PRN. And we can already start to see some intensification of medical therapy while removing medicines that, that may not have such cardiometabolic implications, positive implications. 
And, and this is from the ADA, just to show that there is overwhelming science trials and guidelines out there. But this is a, a very nice tabular summary. It's difficult to read. I put it out there more to show it's aware, and it's very easy to Google and pick up from the ADA website of what are the medicines that have cardiovascular benefit. We have SGL2 inhibitors, GLP-1 RAs, GIP, GLP-1 RAs. With most of the other medicines being neutral, and in some instances, potentially for harm um, to our cardiovascular patients. One of the other factors to consider as well, in starting SGL2 inhibition, it usually means the patients have less hypokalemia when starting aldactone, and in addition, you run much less risk of hypoglycemia, which is one of our fears to promoting cardiovascular disease or causing harm, particularly in some of our more brittle or elderly patients. So, our major health partners alliance with the CMCA. If we, when I was confused at the beginnings, I would often go to their website as well, and they have often indication. There's some general sense of whether there's a class effect or not. In GLP-1s, there's not a total class effect, but there can be some overlap. And in SGL2s, it's generally considered to be a class effect of drug. So, in addition, we have preserved ejection fraction heart failure. We stopped his ACE, we did a 36 hour washout and started subacutral valsard in half a tab. And one of the person asked, why did we stop our ACE inhibitor? And it was going with evidence from the Paragon trial, which while not conclusive, did have a trend to benefit, particularly improved symptoms, and particularly perhaps in the heart failure group where the EF was in his range about 50%. One of the things we found when we made this change in conjunction with SGL2 inhibition, and this was probably about four to six weeks into therapy, was he really started to say how much better he felt. And I think the combination of these two really started to work on his underlying le elevated left atrial pressure and diastolic dysfunction. And it's since this point, he really started to express improvement in symptoms. In addition, we started spironolactone. Again, the top cat, had a trend to benefit, had a diuretic effect, and were also less likely to have to use potassium. And one of the best things I've ever seen in patients is when you say to them, you don't have to take a diuretic, you don't have to take the potassium, that usually gets a smile as they don't have to take the horse pills. Um, so now we're into the zone of goal of titration. Smaglutide, where to go weekly, and pagliflozin, subacutral, spironolactone, torvastatin, and metoprolol. And also, I wanted to make sure we, if we could get him off sulfonylurea, no insulin if possible, although he was taking 21 shots a week, no potassium, no diuretic. And in titrating, I think we can do a patient focus on what seemed to help symptoms. Is he tolerating the med? So as a guideline may suggest, we should increase the maglutide up to two milligrams. If he was getting GI distress, then sometimes to reduce the dose back to the original or just maintain the dose they're at and, and just go with the efficacy that you're getting. And are they having symptoms that a category of med can address or are the numbers that can be treated? For example, titration of, of Jardians from 10 to 25 is questionable as heart failure benefit but it will still provide some renal protection, may provide a little diuresis. So his current medications when I last saw him, were at semaglutide one weekly, empagliflozin 10, subacutral we got to 2426, and aldactone we could only tolerate 12.5. And he would get symptomatic hypertension when we tried to push those drugs much higher. We continued the metoprolol, he was a history of cabbage at a low dose, aspirin, and he's on furosemide 40 milligrams PRN. And, and why we did this, um, we really wanted the goal direct in medical therapy. And although the pillars is often used for reduced ejection fraction heart failure, there's some soft indication from the top cut trials and the um, Paragon trial for Arnie and Aldactone, and we saw symptomatic relief, and there's strong evidence to support the use of SGL2 inhibitors. I think we will see trials emerging that will show the GLP-1 receptor agonists will actually provide improved symptomatology and relief for our diastolic heart failure. One of the pleasing about the med profile is we stopped to sulfonylurea. 
We changed his furosemide to potassium and PRNA only, and we really had the drugs that started to treat the underlying disease process. And I felt at this point we had de-escalated de the pharmaceutical burden while intensifying the treatment. And this was his numbers about six to eight months later. His blood pressure, which was not that bad be to begin with, was now comfortably below our target of 130 over 80. He had dropped a BMI point. His hemoglobin A1C was nice at 5.9, and we had a continuous glucose monitor on him more recently. He was having no lows, and his time in range was about 90%. And look at his kidney function. His GFR improved. His urine albumin protein dropped down to level one, and we've completely changed his profile of likelihood to progression to dialysis. His LDL, we increased his fatorvastatin to 40, and while less than 55 was our goal, he stayed at 55 despite increasing his fatorvastatin to 40. This was the best comment ever. I feel better than I can remember in the last 10 years, Doc. And he's on way fewer meds. And when he was seen last week by my nurse practitioner, Nicole, he is on no insulin. Just to kind of summarize briefly on this case, we kind of challenged the medical inertia. And I chose a case particularly where a patient, while it had a rough history and significant resource utilization, he was actually being substantially improved already. His blood pressure and some of his numbers weren't too bad. But we thought this wasn't good enough. And while he said he felt OK, he still had this on exertion. He's still struggling, and we still felt we had some targets with which we could go after to help him feel better. We collaborated closely and co-managed with his primary care. We intensified this therapy, as I described. We reduced his burden of medication. And just also to put it in context as well, I, I focus this predominantly on his medication. He was also referred for a sleep study and now wear CPAP, and this once again produced an improvement in symptoms and well-being. His ability to exert has improved. We've used cardiac rehab, and we did use significant dietary education. So the resources that were already in place at Major were utilized. And really the goal with promoting a feeling of well-being, each time he's seen now, he says, no doc, I feel good. So just to take a quick look at the outcomes so far. We started taking our first patient in the Cardiometabolic Clinic Alliance at Major Heart Health Partners in February, so we've been going just over a year. And we have a total of about 160 patients enrolled in the cardiac CMCA. The various different criteria, heart failure reduced ejection fraction, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular and prior MI, and chronic kidney disease and diabetes. In addition, an entire category which I have only just really alluded to that are being worked on the primary care in conjunction with ourselves are looking at more primary prevention risk factor profiles. Of the patients, we've consented so far about 138 for the red cap database, and they're fairly evenly split between heart failure, preserved ejection fraction, reduced ejection fraction, and those with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And remember the first goal was to get patients on goal-directed medical therapy. And just to put this in perspective, when you look at the registry databases throughout the country and reviews of organizations, the VA, various Google databases, the estimates were somewhere in the region of 10 to 25 percent. And the CMCA themselves said for heart failure bundle with reduced ejection fraction, their goal for all their Alliance members was to try and get 40 percent of patients on drug. And they thought at the time, because that was doubling basically the national average, that itself was bold. And I'd like to this, and this is really I commend to my team for this. We have got over 80% of goal directed medical therapy are on the bundle. 40 of the 47 are SGL2 inhibitors. Four were intolerant, and we tried and rechallenged, and one refused to rechallenge, and three are actually in process. So if we take the fact that four couldn't tolerate and three are in process, that number is actually higher. We have 36 percent, sorry, 36 on ARNI, and six are on ACE or ARB, and five are in process. 
45 of the 47 are on beta blockers, two were intolerant, and 39 are on mineralocorticoids, with three being intolerant and five in process. And when I say in process, uh, these are fairly new patients to us and we're still in the process of titrating up. And I think the overwhelming point is we've been able to do it. We've been able to get them on in an environment um, using this different system approach that we have uh, and kind of just reorganizing the people we have. Of the 48 with preserved ejection fraction heart failure, 34 on SGL2 inhibitors, three were intolerant and 11 in the process of starting. So once again, significantly high percentage, particularly compared to the national averages of getting these people on the goal directed medical therapy. The type 2 diabetics, over 80%, and GLP-1, GLP-1-RA or SGL-2. With ACE, ARBs, or ANI, we're again up at over 80%. The second goal was to reduce admissions. And I, and I think in these times of limited resource, we're running out of people, it's hard to find nurses. Hospital floors being closed because of understaffing because they're not there or available to be had. We've had one admission for decompensated heart failure. This is early days, I admit. But this is what again one of uh, our sort of proudest moments is our ability to keep people out of the hospital. Um, can I give you sustainability data? Not this year. Um, but so far we've had just one admission for heart failure. And to look, just to give you an idea from the weight loss perspective and the A1C perspective, we took our patients who had had six months or more of therapy. Bear in mind, some of our patients we just signed up in the last week or two. Their starting BMI was 37.6. There were 32 in total who we've started on medications, and this is all comers now. Their BMI has now dropped three units with the 727 pounds of weight loss, and their starting A1C was 6.6, and their current 6.1. I'd just like to say a thank you. I think we have a little time for some questions or for any I can explain in more detail, but a big thank you to Dr. Milkale, Cossaboy, Melissa McGuire, and Andrea Stafos. That's the St. Luke's team. They have been wonderfully supportive, available, um, and their guidance uh, and bringing this structure to market has been fantastic. Major health partners, Jack Horner, the CEO, though, has been wonderfully supportive. Indiana Heart Physicians and the Franciscan Alliance. It's the collaboration that's existed between major Indiana Health and Franciscan that really has been the bedrock of this and launched it forward. And to my team, you guys absolutely rock. You're the ones that have made this possible, brought it to the forefront. Lacey, Nicole, Marissa, Christy, Susanna Payne, and Caitlin, you guys have been wonderful. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Feel free to uh, come off mute and ask a question or type something in the chat if you have a want to uh, send a question that way. Uh, Tony uh, Lewis Genera here. Uh, very good presentation. I appreciate you doing that. Uh, some folks are a little crazy about the needle. Uh, any data on with rebelsas, which is cementaltide bifil, is that as uh, good at all, or is there a role for that? Uh, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, we we have we have defaulted to rebelsas in places when people are are not comfortable with the needle. You don't get quite the weight loss, uh, but you but um, but you you do get some good sugar control, some reduction, and you do get some weight loss. So we have not we've not had to use it much. We found actually a lot of people even who are needle averse. Once we we kind of show them and we have demonstrators uh, uh, of actually being able to get them, but we actually have one person, uh, maybe two on ribelsis, and it, it does produce some positive results. Dr. Bashel, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've come across with the cardiometabolic clinic or program that you're working with? I think the biggest challenge initial fear that we had was would we be able to get approval for the medications? Um, and that has really not borne out, but it required some effort of, of working with the website, working with patient assistance, you know, encouraging patients that these medicines will help, will help you feel better. And if we fill out these forms, 
uh, which we provide assistance with, and then they get filed. We, we've, it's been quite incredible, the approval rate, as we showed in our numbers. It's very rare we've not been able to get them. Bearing in mind, my patient population is diabetic or, or heart disease uh, and tends to have a little bit more sway in getting them approved, but patient assistance has been fantastic. Secondarily, the approval process just for the SGL2 inhibition is much improving. And in addition, these will go generic in a few years. And, and there's also other areas where if we talk with employers and get them to get these drugs on their formularies, because we have to remember it's employees who pay insurance and the insurance mediates it. And if we put these drugs on formularies there, then people can get the drugs that will keep them out of the hospital, help them feel better, help them lose weight, help them get good A1Cs and are well tolerated. And once a patient's in that situation, they don't need to see physicians, physician assistants, et cetera, uh, as much as prior, and they tend to feel better. It just requires a little effort up front. I think the second thing, and this was a personal thing, I have a little bit of an endocrine background, but one of the challenges I would face is, you know, I feel quite comfortable managing volume on a patient. When you're taking a drug that's going to affect blood sugar, who's on insulin, who's on glomeparide, whose volume is up, his sugar is up, and you're going to start a drug that's going to interact and affect both of those processes, it was a bit nerve wracking at first to do that. That's where collaboration with primary care was really helpful. The support of Mike Hancock and the crew of endocrinology was helpful. But it also is a little bit reflective of back to medical training, the old phrase, see one, do one, teach one, is once you've done it a few times, not only does it become um, less nerve wracking, it actually becomes quite enjoyable uh, and quite rewarding. When a patient comes back in a few weeks, they've lost five pounds of fluid, the sugar's improving, they feel better. And yes, they will complain sometimes of it making them pee a lot. Uh, and this this can improve in time in some, but not all. Um, I think the second, and one of the biggest challenges of, is we do worry about cost. But in a couple of different environments I, I've worked in, one we're here would be the VA. Uh, one is a couple of different countries I'm familiar with. These medicines are available um, free or, or for minimal co-pays. And we still find patients are started on them and then are stopped. Um, and I think the education in relation to how it will help and how to adjust dietary habits in taking it have been really helpful. And that does take a little time of the education in the room with the patient uh, has been really beneficial. I think one of our, the third one is one of our, our big sort of work efforts is to have ongoing in-person meetings, be collaborative. And we've even worked closely with the inpatient physicians as well, particularly with SGL2 inhibition. So our patients are often discharged from the hospital uh, on the drugs that we want with the appropriate team follow-up. So it does require a little time up front, a little organization presentations and, and, and education through, throughout a system, but it is very doable. Um, and I think when people know, for example, a very common uh, problem to happen up front, I hate to use the word problem, but it was, was uh, SGL2 inhibition would be started, their sugar would drop too low and it would be stopped and the patient would then be fearful of it. But in actual fact, it was started, but they were still on insulin without it being adjusted, or they would still be on glimepiride without it being adjusted. And when you explain to them later the benefits and the fact it was the other drugs that dropped them low, they're often quite quick and pleased to cut back their other medications, uh, the glimepiride and insulins, and go to the newer meds. Uh, and it's often proven out. I, I've never known a period of cardiology and cardiometabolic care where patients will come into you and tell you they're feeling better on such a regular basis. And I think most of us are signed up to be healthcare workers because that's what we want to hear. Um, so access, I think it can be a little complicated introducing them, particularly sulfonylureas and, and SGL2 in the original state, but we have plenty of help around, plenty of support. It's often not something that has to be done on the same day, but, but sequence, if you often look at patients who've been through um, uh, your, the clinic, they often have multiple visits uh, and they're being moved towards the same common goal. And I think the cardiometabolic clinic does provide a mechanism of expediting what, what people were doing anyway. You know, the basis and collaboration and foundation of care, it's all there and it's being done well. In some ways, it just expedites it and it helps get through some of these barriers with assistance in getting patient medication approval um, and um, educating the patients and guiding them and following them up initially. And we are actually starting to transfer some patients, you know, back to back to um, the original consultants to us. Does that answer the question? Yes, that's um, a lot of good information. 
So there's a question in the chat, Dr. Bashel, that from Lindsay Job, and um, it says, any recommendations on how to get terzepidide approved for individuals with cardiometabolic syndrome? Pushback from insurance companies in a patient with type 2 diabetes, NAFLD, morbid obes obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, BMI greater than 50, and hypertension. Yeah, I, I think um, usually going to the website, there's a coupon you can print. And as long as you've been in diabetes, they can use that coupon in most cases. Um, and that is certainly a cardiometabolic person. I'd be happy to help. But often we're finding with patients with that, obviously it can depend, it depend specifically on that. There are a few insurances which are very hard to get around. Um, but that patient I think would get approved depending on their specific insurance. And I only say that because I actually just had someone in my clinic today with that profile and I just heard back they've got it approved. So, but she's more than happy to contact us in the clinic for specifics if, if she runs into trouble. And there's a message from uh, Dr. Polly Moore that says, thanks, Tony. This is very wonderful work. I feel comfortable with these, quote, non-cardiac medications. Good. So how do you feel about non-cardiac medications? Did, did, wait, I'm referring to, I, I, I was uh, we're thinking it's the SGL2s or GLP1s. Because I, I would, I would, I'll take a step back and I, I, I would argue and potentially we're going to start proving that, you know, the New England Journal showed GLP-1 receptor agonists were cardiovascular protective and are actually cardiovascular medicines. Uh, and sometimes in the approval process, we'll quote this and it helps us get approved. I think the GLP-1s are also being used for uh, preserved ejection fraction heart failure with a couple of trials that should be published here uh, fairly soon. Um, I, I think the SGL-2s are... are well, they were the ultimate cardiac medication until we found out the, the impact implications they had for, for chronic kidney disease and proteinuria. Uh, and the results there were even more astoundingly good. So I, I tend to focus those, they, they are actually cardiometabolic cardiac medications. They just have wider ranging, wider ranging benefits uh, and they tend not to drop sugars too low. They tend to be well tolerated. They tend to be additive, if not synergistic. Um, and it just requires a little monitoring of the blood sugars and volume status, particularly on those on sulfonylureas and insulin. So, so um, I, I think, and I, I, I do understand people being a little uncomfortable at first, but I, I think they they are cardiometabolic, cardiovascular medications, very much so. In, in addition, I think that we will see them used for a much wider range. I think we'll see them used for NASH and NAFL. Uh, we, they are being used for chronic kidney disease. Uh, and, and we haven't really mentioned the most popular one that we hear all the time, which is weight loss. Uh, to put it in perspective, GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, and, and uh, tazepatide are seeing weight loss that we've never seen before. And the trials at 18 months, we're getting 18 and 22 percent. And the groups that are developing other meds with combos, for for example, Boehringer Ingelheim are developing a combo with a different uh, a different molecule in, a different increase in. Uh, Lily one has one coming out with three in. Uh, it finally is giving us the tools to fight the sort of obesity diabetic epidemic we're facing. Um, and, and that's just getting worse and worse. And it's becoming more and more international. We often quoted, oh, uh, you know, North America and Europe, where we're starting to see it in, in other countries, in African countries, um, getting big, people getting bigger and bigger. And the, the cardiometabolic implications are, are, are extremely concerning. And we've now given some drugs that will actually help people lose weight. And, and the implications for sleep apnea, almost nobody gets through the cardiometabolic clinic without a referral for sleep apnea, um, which again promotes well-being, cardioprotective, may even ameliorate the, the hormonal milieu that leads to the diabetic problems uh, and obesity problems. So the drugs, positive implications and expanding out. And just to put it in a little perspective, we're seeing these being researched for um, for Alzheimer's as well, um, because it is actually a centrally acting, a naturally centri centrally acting substance that's uh, from the nucleus tract solitaris, mediated through the hypothalamus and neurotransmitters. And I think that's how it moderates the brain's desire to feed itself to excess. And for the first time uh, I've ever known, people who are large are coming in saying, you know, I'm able to control how much I eat. Uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. But back to the original question, I do consider these at least in part cardiovascular medications. 
and I think we're going to see some more research coming through soon um, that that'll prove it, particularly with the two trials on heart failure I was talking about. Did that answer the question or did I hear it right? Yeah, Dr. Moore put in um, GLP-1 when you were asking which she was referring to, so. And she was referring to as feeling a bit uncomfortable. She just said that your presentation is um, helping her feel more comfortable. Well, and, and I will say, you know, thanks for that, Polly, and I appreciate that that comment immensely. I, I, a lot of people have come up to me and said, you know, I feel a little uncomfortable with this. And I, might, I have a little bit of an endocrine background, but when I started this, one of my biggest personal, um, you know, medical inertias, if you like, was, you know, when I hit that point, when it comes to injectables, I'm going to get help. And then he went back literally to medical training after I'd done a couple in conjunction with, with the guidance of primary care in, 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 and the guidance of the CMCA and Mike Hancock. We, we can actually, you can actually manage your way through quite a few now. And, and the knowledge that I often ask a patient, say, well, are you comfortable just doing this? Or do you want to talk to your primary care or endocrinologist? And, and many will go, no, I'm okay with this. I've got my monitor on. Oh, no, I check my sugars. I know what I'm doing. If you think that's all do. And sometimes you'll get a call in a week saying, well, my sugars have popped up. And sometimes you'll say, hey, they're dropping down. I cut back some more. And I think that's where the sort of follow-up phone call, follow-up availability uh, of my nurse Peyton um, really it's, it prevents a visit, ameliorates meds, and allows for titration. So it, it helps being expeditious while being safe. Uh, and we don't necessarily have to have like a, a, a per, an in-person visit. Um, Gretchen uh, of the endocrine group has been fantastic as well. So, but yeah, I, I do understand it. And, and I think we are setting up to get some people come in and educate on it. And I think one of the things that really helps as well, because everything we do in medicine is a bit of a risk trade-off decision. It is a bit nerve wracking to use something like this the first time. But when you see the overwhelming benefits of it, uh, it, it, it becomes exciting. Um, you've got a drug that protects cardiovascular disease, helps weight, may protect heart failure, helps people feel better, maybe pre pre preventing or slowing the progress uh, of NAFL and NASH, uh, you know, preventing uh, um, Alzheimer's. Uh, they're truly remarkable. Um, and someone asked me recently, said, well, which one of the GLP-1s is sponsoring you? You're promoting it so heavily. And I say, none yet. Um, it, it's just great to see patients take them and do so well. And the, and the other one to put in, because we, we, we have, a, have only really alluded to things like sleep apnea and NASH, but the one I haven't mentioned is for those patients who are particularly large, you can use a combination of some weight loss, surgery, and the meds after as well. And it's an incredible success taking people from some of the, some really substantial BMIs where they now have maybe even just overweight or in that obese range. So we are seeing substantial. I think the one thing is, as they're fairly new to all this, sustainability over prolonged periods of time will also be the next thing to watch. But the randomized controlled trials and evidence would suggest uh, with the right management and maintaining a uh, drug uh, that they will achieve that. And, and I actually have a personal friend who's actually taken her BMI from over 55 and she's now just overweight with a combination of GLP-1 and uh, the gastric sleeve. So, um, Dr. Bashel, there's a question from Dr. Chug in the chat that says, can you speak a bit about the benefits of the CMCA and how we can implement this program throughout the system? I think so. I think and what I tried to allude with the case, and probably obviously, obviously didn't do it quite, so quite as clear as I wanted, so thanks for the question, is it's the way the, met, the care is organized. And this, this was an idea implanted to me back when I was a fellow. And, and then at IHP, this is what we did. We reorganized how we did STEMI treatments and we improved the outcome. We didn't change stents. We didn't really get new meds. We just reorganized how we did it. And it was amazing, the implications. And this is kind of similar. A, a better analogy perhaps would be lipid clinic. You know, the lipid clinic that, that's run here it gets amazing results, amazing number of people at targets. And as we want lower for longer, this is really important. And it's just taking that next step of what is already present here and organizing it 
um, whether by referral uh, to, to the CMCA, but it provides guidelines organizations. They come and help you implement, get the right people in the right place, and then a tracking of the REDCap database where you can upload information, know how well you're doing, and it opens up new doors uh, up to areas where you can improve patient care. One of the things we're looking at uh, in the Shelbyville community is, is the primary prevention component uh, and how we can use the CMCA to leverage uh, the database we have and say, well, these are the outcomes we're getting. How can we get a wider range? Um, so do I think it's implementable here? Absolutely. I think we really have the bedrock already in place. Um, I, I think we have a lot of physicians uh, who are already very interested in the concept and how to move it forward. Uh, and how to get access to drug, and then, then, uh, and then the other medical therapies, which are not necessarily pharmaceutical. We have a, it's all here, uh, and the reason that I love major hospitals so much is really like a mini me of the Franciscan. They've worked so closely together for so long that it's to extrapolate it out. And I think the implications for patient care benefit longitudinally are phenomenal. Uh, uh, just to put it in in context, even if we don't get quite the high numbers um, that we've been getting sustained, it is still substantially more than the 15% national average of patient on medication. And the implications for admission, patient well-being, it, it is, it's incredible. Uh, it is like an impl you know, in the same way lipid clinics and e-heart programs benefited patient care. Um, uh, and once you had the patient stable and the CMCA put it together, guidelines, education, training, leadership, uh, and all led by uh, Dr. Costa Board, who, who's just phenomenal in, in supporting a role along with his team. So it, it was, did that answer the question? Sometimes I get a little carried away. <laughs> There's um, a, another comment in the chat that from Lindsay Job. She said, um, would love to see this program implemented, available in the Greensburg area whenever the bandwidth is available. Much needed. Yeah, and I think um, I think Decatur has actually a slightly higher heart failure mortality than, than Shelbyville, and I think the idea, and this is another exciting time where, where a program such as the CMCA, we were, uh, Lacey Harness and I, were, were, who, who basically brought uh, the CMCA to major major health partners, were, were at uh, a presentation of, of the governor, and they're actually introducing new public health programs um, to support uh, particularly rural health and how to promote the health and well-being of the Indiana population and programs such as this for primary and prevention care uh, I think would truly dovetail nicely into into like a strategic maneuver uh, that, the, that the governor is making and I think the way we're going to address health care to a large extent anywhere is we come up with local solutions whether it's at a hospital a city a county and then and then uh, let them grow out from there so so into the Greensburg area yeah, we'd love to. That would be great. Uh, and then it, throughout the Franciscan system, I think there's areas for benefit. Uh, we, we have the people and the, and the collaboration, uh, and most of what we need is already here. So there's um, several thank yous in the chat. Um, Dr. Chug said that when you asked if he you answered his question, he said, yes, well done. And then um, Dr. Brewer in Greensburg said, I agree for Greensburg, and thank you so much for this. And then uh, Dr. Jonathan Mandelbaum, he um, wrote in the chat that says, I'm optimistic that by November, we will have a board certified medical bariatric MD. And our goal is to restart a medical weight loss section of our weight center soon thereafter. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm smiling. <laughs> Well, we are at our time, unless there's any more questions that anyone wants to ask while we're all together. If not, uh, thank you, Dr. Bashel. Appreciate your time and your expertise and sharing this information with everyone. Don't forget to um, complete the evaluation form to be able to get your uh, credit for this course. And we look forward to the feedback. Our next presentation is going to be um, in one month, and it will be on stroke risk reduction with Dr. Eric Kravitsky. So watch for that promotion so that you can participate in that as well. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Have a good evening. Thanks, Tony. Good night, everybody.